So good to be here on this wonderful 2018 Father's Day and so grateful to God that he brought you here today for this uh, season, for this time, and particularly for this word. Um, my wife and I have been sitting down now for the last month or so and we are uh, redoing our will, so to speak. Uh, we did a will a number of years ago. A lot of things have changed over the course of time, and so we're going back and revisiting. As a matter of fact, uh, sometime in the next several months, uh, you're going to have the opportunity as a church to do exactly that and uh, make that available to you as well. But uh, right now, we're just kind of going through it ourselves. And uh, I, I, I know that there have been a lot of uh, additions to what we want to do and what we want to accomplish. And, uh, when we get through with this life, we want what God has entrusted to us to continue to be good stewards of that which he's given to us. So even after we're um, in heaven, we want to make sure what he gave to us is being used for his glory. And so we're, we're looking at uh, how we can bless the church and how we can bless Metrolina Christian Academy and, and uh, making all of that happen and making it legal. So that, that kind of stimulated some thought, and I, I got away from uh, what I had intended to do this morning. Uh, you know, we've been doing the um, questions that demand answer series in June, and so I, I posed a new question for today because it is Father's Day, and, and the question is, what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? What kind of legacy do you... Have y'all seen those bumper stickers on the back side of these uh, motorhomes? You, you've seen them, haven't you? I'm spending my kid's inheritance. Uh, I, I'm not talking about little trinkets that you may have bought your kids along the way. I'm, I, I'm not talking about some house or a car. Uh, I'm talking about what kind of legacy. When, when I talk about legacy here, I'm talking about what kind of character are you leaving as a legacy. Um, I, I'm talking about a living faith uh, that you are leaving your kids. Do, do your kids know that Christ is important to you? Uh, are you leaving that? Uh, when, when they walk by that casket and that old clay is there, are they going to be able to look down in there and say, you know what, my dad loved Jesus. And I know that his faith was living and that it was alive and that it was important to my dad. They're going to remember that about you. I think it's important that your kids are left a legacy. I think it's important that your kids are left um, the, the knowledge of your walk with God. I, every day that I walk into my house, and I've told you this before, and I'm not embarrassed to tell you again, but God gave me a promise a number of years ago out of Isaiah 59, 21. And uh, it simply said the words, and I'll put it in my words. This is how I saw it when, when God gave it to me. He says, the words that I have put in you, I have put in your children and your children's children forever. And as soon as I got that, I got a crayon kind of crude of me, but I, I got a crayon and I went out and I wrote it on the wall of the garage as I am walking into my back door every day. I am reminded of that promise. The words I put in you, I put in your children. But you know, here's the deal. Do my children know that God put that word in my heart? Do I know that that word that he put in my heart, do I know that it's in their hearts? And do I know that it's in my grandkids' hearts? Well, matter of fact, I do because God told me. But I'm asking you, do you know that? What kind of legacy are you going to leave behind? So take your Bible and look with me uh, to the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua, chapter number 4. Joshua chapter 4. And just look at this incredible story. The nation of Israel now have... Uh, come out of Egyptian bondage. They are engaging in, in uh, going over into Jericho. And they're crossing the Jordan River uh, to get in there. Now, in getting into this 
whole story. I want you to see some lessons today that God unfolds before us right out of this text. Now, the first lesson that I want you to see is this. God always intervenes in our lives. Now, some of you didn't hear that. You were a little bit distracted or uh, weren't quite ready. or You're still trying to find the passage. I just want to tell you, God always intervenes in our lives. Pick it up in verse number one, if you will, Joshua 4. Came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan that the Lord spake unto Joshua saying, take you 12 men out of the people of of tribe, uh, uh, out of every tribe a man and command ye them saying, take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, 12 stones and you'll carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you're lodged this night. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had uh, prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe of man. And Joshua said unto them, pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan and take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. This, uh, that, this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come saying, what mean ye by these stones? That uh, ye will answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. Now, when I read that, it automatically occurs to me that God thought that it was important that people knew that he intervened, that their children knew that he had intervened in the affairs of their life. Now, here's the old story. God says, Joshua, uh, wherever a priest's foot stood, I want you to take a rock out of the, out of the uh, riverbed there. Uh, there are 12 of them. And so I want you to get a rock out of there and I want you to bring them over and we want to put up a memorial over here on the dry side of the river as a reminder so that when generations come later, they'll see this memorial and they'll say, what does this mean? And, 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 People will be able to say, oh, nothing to that, man. It's the fact that God intervened in the life of the nation of Israel and parted the Jordan River so that they could come into the promised land. God intervened in their life. Do you know that the Bible is power-packed full of one event after another where God intervened in people's lives? You remember Abraham and Sarah about 100 years old? Neither one of them able to have kids at that age. And yet God says, hmm, you're, you're going to have so many kids that uh, the stars can't number them and the sand can't number them. But they're thinking to themselves, yeah, right. But when God got through intervening in their life, they had a little boy named Isaac. He intervened again when he said uh, to Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and I want you to go worship on this mountain up there. And little did Isaac know that he was going to be the target of that sacrifice. And they get up there and Isaac's laying on the altar ready to be offered up. Abraham's got the knife in his hand about to plunge it into the chest of his only son that he loved deeply. And all of a sudden God says, hold everything. Once again, he intervened and showed them a ram over into the thicket that they offered up as a sacrifice. God intervened again with Moses when he was trying to lead the nation of Israel out of bondage. He kept telling Pharaoh, man, you're gonna need to let them go. God's already let us go. You need to let this thing go. And, and, and Pharaoh kept hardening his heart and hardening his heart. And then God intervened and sent the death angel and Pharaoh got the message and let him go. God intervened in... Uh, Daniel's life when he was thrown into that den of lions and he shut the mouths of the lions. God's in the business, ladies and gentlemen, of intervening into the affairs of our life. 
powerful lesson here that we all need to hear and learn and understand again and again and again in history. Now here again in Joshua chapter 4 when God intervened and he held back the waters of the Jordan River about 16 miles north of where 2 million of the nation of Israel crossed over on dry ground and they built a memorial there as a sign of God's intervention. There's a close resemblance to this whole story in the New Testament when God looked down through the eons of time and he saw the sinfulness and the desperation of the sin of mankind and knew that the only way that that sin problem could ever be dealt with is that he was going to have to get involved. And so he sent his son, his only son, into the world, born of a virgin, lived sinless, died on an old rugged cross in your spot and in my spot, in your place and in my place, was buried and rose on the third day, ascended back to the heavenly father, and one day is going to return. God intervened on your behalf and my behalf. Well, maybe today, as you've already heard in the music, in our worship time, and I looked around and I, I saw weeping in the choir and I, I already know some of the things that are going on in those people's lives and I, I knew some of the tears that were flowing today because of the loss of a dad or loss of a mom and that weeping that was up there. And there may be some tears in your eyes today because there's another Jordan River that you are facing. There's an impossible situation in your life. There's an obstacle out there that you, you've, you've, done the, you've done the math, you've done the calculations, you, you, you've already decided that this is insurmountable and, and there's no way that I can cross over this. There's no way to get around this. There's no way to get over it. And you're thinking, what in the world am I going to do? May I say to you, that the same God who intervened in Abraham and Sarah's life, the same God who intervened in Joshua's day is the same God who wants to intervene in your life too. Let me give you number two. Lesson number two, God expects total obedience from those to whom he is going to intervene. Let me say it again so you won't miss it. God expects total obedience from those of whom he wants to intervene. Pick it up with me, if you will, in verse number 8. And the children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan, as the Lord spake unto Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged, and laid them down there. They didn't try to convince God that there was a better way. They didn't try to alter God's plans. They didn't try to deviate from that which God had instructed to them at all. They simply did what God told them to do. Pick it up in verse 9. Joshua set up 12 stones. Now watch this now. If you're not careful, you get confused because this is a different set of stones. He set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests, which bear the Ark of the Covenant, stood. And they're there unto this day. In other words, he put up 12 stones there in the middle. You say, how did he do that? Well, remember, the water has rolled back. They're walking on dry ground. And he took advantage of that and he said, I'm going to put a memorial right here in the very spot where we crossed uh, over uh, the Jordan, these 12 stones. So when people come by and they see these 12 stones, they say, what, what does this mean? Well, this is where we crossed over on dry ground. You're kidding. That's unbelievable. No. It's the way God intervened because the people of God obeyed what God said to do. Powerful word. Look at verse 10. 
For the priests which bear the ark stood in the midst of Jordan. Now watch carefully the wording. Until everything was finished. That the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people according to all. Say the word all. According to all that Moses commanded Joshua. And the people hasted and passed over until everything, until everything that God had said for them to do was accomplished. They stayed put. They stood firm until everything had been accomplished. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the kind of obedience that God wants from me. This is the kind of obedience that God wants from all of us. James, in in his little uh, epistle, says, You know, it's not just about hearing the word. It's really about doing the word. Now, hold your spot. Put your little ribbon in your Bible in this Joshua 4 passage. And go over with me to 1 John chapter number um, 3, if you will. 1 John chapter number 3. And uh, I want you to see verse 24. The last verse in chapter uh, 3. Okay, last verse, chapter 3. Now, notice what he says. He that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. Now, here's the real deal. The test of whether we belong to God, the test of whether he's living his life in us, is nothing less than obedience. It's a powerful presentation of whether we are really children of God or not if we are living a life that God has said is pleasing uh, unto him. Matter of fact, Jesus said uh, that if we'll bear much fruit, then it proves that we are his disciple. Who is a real believer? Who is a real child of God? Who is a real Christian in today's world? It's one, ladies and gentlemen, who doesn't bail out on God when things get tough. And I'm gonna add one to that. It's a person who doesn't bail out on God when things are going good either. Who stays consistent. Who, who stays steady and firm, who mans their posts, who's in the middle of the river and stay in their place until God says, come on home. I think with all of my heart, especially coming out of the Southern Baptist Convention of 2018, I think what our culture needs, I think what our denomination needs is some good old stick to some tenacity, some persistence, and some consistency, if you will. I heard about a little boy who uh, went to his mom and his daddy and he said he wanted a watch. And they didn't feel like that he was old enough for a watch. They didn't feel like that he could manage one or it just wasn't time or maybe they didn't have the money, but, but, but he wouldn't let up. I mean, every minute of every day, he just bombarded them. I want to watch, I want to watch, I want to watch. They finally got up to there with that and they said, you better hush and don't you bring up for the next seven days. We don't want to hear one word about a watch and if you say anything, buddy, you're going to pay for it. Mm. So it just stymied that little boy for the next seven days. It was all that he could do not to bring it up. It was all that he could do not to mention it. It it just about destroyed him because he wanted that watch so desperately. Finally, on Sunday afternoon, on that seventh day, the family all gathered together as they did every week and uh, they had family devotions and in their family devotions, everybody in the family had to read a passage of scripture and everybody in the family had to make some kind of comment on it. And so everybody in the family had done it. It was his time now to read his passage of scripture. So he said, I want to call your attention to the book of Matthew. And in the book of Matthew, it says, so I say one, I say to all, watch. Mm. 
We need that kind of consistency. We need that kind of persistence. We need that kind of discipline in our obedience unto God. Now notice what he said in verse number 10, that last little phrase in verse 10. The Bible says that they hasted over. I, I mean, you could just see them as they were jogging across on dry ground. And, and, and my liberal professors at Furman University, when I was going through, they would discount that whole thing and say, well, the reason that they ran across and the reason that they had to hurry and get across is because of the limited power of God. The Jordan River pressure was mounting so much that he was holding it back and he couldn't hold it back forever and he was about to let go and so they had to hurry and get across. Do you know what I, if you believe that, go stand in your head in the middle of Lake Norman somewhere. You know, I don't believe that there's anything impossible with God so that when God comes along in your life and he says to us, jump, then our response ought to be how high and how long do you want me to stay up there? That's the kind of obedience that we must have in pleasing God. Notice verse 11. Came to pass when all the people were clean passed over that the ark of the Lord passed over and the priests in the presence of the people. And the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, half the tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the children of Israel as Moses spake unto them. About 40,000 prepared for war passed over before the Lord unto battle to the plains of Jericho. Now let me tell you what we would have done. Here, here we got this deal. We got the Jordan River and all of a sudden the Spirit of God comes on the scene. People obey and God stops the water of Jordan from flowing. Here's what we would have done. Man, we would have thrown up some tents. We would have got us some flags. We would have started selling hot dogs and t-shirts and we would have made a party out of that whole deal. I can just see it. We would have celebrated like nothing before. Do you notice the way that the nation of Israel did it? The Bible says that they crossed over 40,000 of them were prepared for battle. 40,000 of them were prepared for war. I've told you this for 35 years, and I don't ever get tired of telling you. Do you know one of the most dangerous times in the life of a child of God is right after a major victory? That's when the enemy comes at us the quickest, the most powerful. And you've got to understand, ladies and gentlemen, we are not tourists down here. But the Bible says that we are in a battle. We're in a war. And we need to be ready for battle when we cross over the Jordans of our life. Let me give you number three. You ready for this one? It's pretty simple. God's timing is impeccable. God's timing in our life is absolutely impeccable. Watch this in verse 14. On that day, the Lord magnified Joshua in the sight of all Israel. And they feared him as they feared Moses all the days of his life. Now, there's something very important in that passage that if you're not careful, you just kind of overlook it. The Bible didn't say Joshua exalted Joshua. The Bible didn't say the nation of Israel exalted Joshua. The Bible says the Lord exalted Joshua. He was not in that exalted position that he put himself in. God put him in there. I want to say a word to the young generation of Southern Baptist leaders in the country today. Let me just tell you, friend, it's God who needs to be exalting that leaders. It's not self that needs to be exalting the leaders. Turn over with me to Luke chapter 14. I want you to see a verse. Luke chapter 14. And uh, notice verse number 8, if you will. Luke 14 and verse number 8. <clears throat> now, now listen to the words of the Lord. And he's really saying, uh, hey, when you go to some kind of festive occasion, don't really go to the highest seat in the house. If you do, you're liable to get embarrassed. 
choose the lowest seat in the house so that when the leader comes in and he sees you sitting in the high place and says, you don't belong there, I got somebody else that belongs there, and puts you in the low place and you get embarrassed. Watch this in verse eight. When you're bidding of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him, and he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when you're bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room that when he is bade cometh, he may say unto thee, friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased or humbled. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Let me just say a word here. Joshua was not a preacher. Joshua was not a prophet. Joshua was not a priest. He was a leader because his exalted position is something that he deferred to God. And he would later come on and he would say, hey, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Powerful words. Now pick it up in verse 15. In Joshua 4, and the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Command the priests that bear the ark of the testimony that they come up out of Jordan. Joshua therefore commanded the priests, saying, Come ye up out of Jordan. And it came to pass when the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord were come up out of the midst of Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up unto dry land, that the waters of Jordan returned unto their place, And flowed over all his banks as they did before. Powerful words. If you go back to chapter 3, and I believe it's verse 13 if I remember right. You you go back to that chapter and, and that verse. You discover that the very first priest that put his toe into the water, the waters then roll back. And now in chapter 4, the very last priest, as he is coming up out of the water, when the last priest heel left that dry riverbed and stepped out on the dry ground above, is the very second that God's water then began to flow all over again. What are you saying? What's the point of this? The point is simply... God's timing is impeccable in our lives. He is seldom early, but he is never late. Now, look at the legacy beginning in verse 19. People came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal in the east border of Jericho. And those 12 stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. Pretty self-explanatory, isn't it? But I'm getting ready just to shake you up. I'm getting ready to break your heart. And the whole point of the message is going to come flowing in the next few minutes. I want you to go over with me to a different book. I want you to go to the book of Judges. And I want you to see chapter number two with me. Just a few pages uh, toward Revelation. Don't go too far or you'll miss it. Judges chapter number two, about 10 or 12 pages over. I want you to pick it up in verse number 8. Chapter 2, verse 8. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died. He's 110 years old. They buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath, uh, in the mountain of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gosh. 
And also all that generation, all of Joshua's generation, all of the generation that were part of the miracle of the crossing of the Jordan River, all that generation gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. How tragic. How tragic. In spite of the memorial, in spite of the word that God had given to Joshua, which asked them to tell, tell your children all about this memorial. Relay it to them. Make sure that they understand what happened here today. In spite of God's divine intervention into their life, a whole generation rose up that didn't know God. Isn't that heartbreaking? Look at verse 11, same chapter. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. They forsook the Lord God of their fathers which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger and, and they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. You've heard the old saying, what goes around comes around. It is true. Take it from somebody who knows and has been there. You only get one chance with your kids. You only get one chance with your grandkids. There are no redos. Can't do it over. No reruns. And the question, parents, today is what kind of legacy are you going to leave your kids? What kind of legacy are you going to leave your grandkids? What's your legacy going to be to your children? Because you only have one chance at it. And once that chance comes and goes, you will never get it again. So what will they remember you for? I'm going to tell you this. You ready? It's not going to be for what kind of nice house that you lived in. Not going to be some car that you drove. It's not going to be some little trinket that you bought them uh, somewhere along the way. It's not going to be because of the clothes that you arrayed them in. It's not what you had nor gave them material but it's who you are, who you are spiritually. That's what you can give to your children that they can take on with them. I want to give you one more. And it's this, God has a purpose in what he does. Okay? God has a purpose in what he does. Pick it up now, I'm back in Joshua 4. In verse 23, for the Lord your God, now watch this, this is so Important For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over. Notice the first word of the last verse. That. He says, I dried up the Jordan River. I dried up the Red Sea. That. Here it goes. All the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord that it is mighty. He's got a purpose. 
God's intervening times, when you're facing some obstacle, when, when, when you're about to drown, when you're facing difficulties in your life, when, when there's some insurmountable issues that you think are going on and all of a sudden God comes on the scene and he takes care of the whole issue of your life, he's not doing it simply to show you that he is a divine paramedic. He has a purpose. And that is for us to be a living legacy or a testimony to all who witness how we go through those experiences in life so that they too can believe and they would stand in holy awe of who God really is in our life and in their own life. Now I want to ask you as we started out this morning, what are you going to leave behind? How many of you have sat down with your son or daughter and just simply recounted the day that you got saved with them, the day God changed your life, and and shared with them how important it is, how important God is in your life? So, So when your kids walk by that clay that you lived in for a little while, are they going to know, my dad loved Jesus with all of his heart? My mom loved God with all of her heart. It's the most important thing in the world was my dad's relationship to Jesus. I'm going to tell you something else, guys. It's really important that you know about your children's faith. It's really important you know that God's important to them. Do you know that? Have you ever... Have you ever just had that conversation with your kids? Is God really important to you? Tell me about the day that you got saved. Remind me of when God changed your life. Sitting yesterday, as I always do, I've told you this numerous times on Saturday, and I had some time just for myself and and just reflecting a little bit. And And the verse came to me. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I want my kids to know that about me. I want them to know that about me. Do they know it about you? Would you stand with me and let's pray together? Father, thank you for our time today. Thank you for the power and the validity of your word, the strength of your word. Thank you, God, that you have left your word for us, God, to communicate truth to us. And, and, and Lord, thank you for these lessons that we, we grab hold of today. That Lord, that you are a sovereign God and that you do intervene in our life. God, that your timing is impeccable. Lord, there's some folks that are going through some tough times today. I saw it on their face. God, I I witnessed the tears. I I know what's behind many of those tears. God, there's a lot of people here this morning that are suffering. There's a lot of people here today that have those, uh, what, what they sense as insurmountable issues. God, let them know that you're still on the throne. And God, you're the same God who intervened in Joshua's day and you want to intervene in their life today. God, let them know that you want to do that. And help us, Lord, to get that word from you and help us to practice that obedience. And not just, God, not just to say it with our mouth, but God, to live it out. God, there's a lot of folks today that say they love God. Maybe social media says they don't love you as much as, Lord, they really ought to. Lord, I I just pray that we wouldn't just pick and choose some cafeteria style of Christianity, that we pick and choose that kind of life that we want to live rather than what your word says, God. I pray, Lord, that our families would know, everybody in our family would know you're more important to us than anything in the world. 
that we live it out. We don't, don't just say it. But God, we live it out. We're doers of your word. In Jesus' name.